Welcome, everybody. I'm still going to introduce myself, but this room is filled with almost every single person that I know, so it's really kind of exciting. But for those who don't know me, um, I'm Anel Miller, the executive director of the Society of Illustrators. And I just want to say, as we're winding down almost this first day, it's been unbelievable. And we are just so thrilled to be continuing what was given such a great foundation. I know Ellen is here with us. Thank you for being here, Ellen. And um, we're just so excited at the society that we can continue this incredible tradition and make it bigger, make it better, make it be more aware to the, the public and to artists. And it's really, really exciting for us. So thank you all for joining us to, for, with my wonderful panel. Um, I've been at the Society, as I said, I don't know if I did say it already, for six years as the executive director. Um, I was trained as an illustrator, a fashion illustrator, went to the High School of Art and Design and then went on to Parsons School of Design. And there are some High School of Des Art and Design people here. Yes, there are. And Parsons, yeah, great. Um, so it's really great for me to have come full circle in my professional career and now be back at this place that... I love so much, and I think those of you who know me, and even those of you who don't know me, know how passionate I am about the society, and now MOCA, and all things that relate to art and artists. So it's, it's just really all good stuff. So this hour, we are going to introduce you to some wonderful members of our Society of Illustrators iconic artists and designers who represent all that is great about lots of different genres of illustration. And I have given them, I've given them a little, you know, some questions in advance, so I'm not totally surprising I forgot them. Did you the forget them? Were. I have no idea, which is probably just as It's great. probably better, Peter. It's probably better. It's a good thing that you're here. So it's really, I think that it's, it's really significant. It really says something about the Society of Illustrators to have all of these unbelievable people sitting up here with me representing the society in so many different ways. And they all, all are really active and do amazing things for us um, year after year. So I'm going to just take a brief moment and introduce all of them, if you don't already know them. Peter DeSevs, Illustration and Character Designs are known throughout the world. Entire his, world. Yeah, <laughs> his work spans three decades, that's dating you a little bit, and various media, including magazines, books, print and television advertising, and animated feature films. Best recognized for his many New Yorker covers and his character designs for the three blockbuster Ice Age movies. Scrat is now an international icon, as we know. He has also contributed to the films Mulan, A Bug's Life, Tarzan, and Finding Nemo. And who knows what he's doing next? He knows, but sometimes he doesn't ever tell me. I forgot that, too. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. Sometimes he tells me. Nora Krug's illustrations appear in a multitude of publications, including the New York Times, the LA Times, The Guardian, and so much more. Her long list of published books includes the graphic novel Red Riding Hood Redo and Shadow Atlas, the children's book My Cold Went on Vacation. She's chaired our annual competition. She's been involved with us for many, many years. Her awards are too numerous to list, as well as the fellowships she's been awarded. So she's not only incredibly creative, but she's incredibly smart. <laughs> she is currently an associate professor at Parsons, the new school for design. Arnold Roth has been a humorous illustrator. Humorous, right? Humorous. You've been a humorous illustrator and cartoonist <laughs> <laughs> for over six decades and for most of that time has freelanced. His big breakthrough came in 1957 when he started working on Trump, Playboy's satiric magazine, and on Humbug, both the inventions of Harvey Kurtzman, founder of Mad Magazine. Roth did what he called pure humor, ideas executed solely for the sake of comedy and satire. He has won numerous medals, including the Rubin Award 
and he was inducted into the Society's Hall of Fame in 2009. J.J. Settlemeyer is an illustrator, designer, author, curator, and film director and producer. I think we need to add a few more things to that list. Bottle washer. Bottle washer, good. <laughs> He and his wife, Patrice, run J.J. Settlemeyer Productions, Inc., an animation graphic design studio they established in 1990 to create and produce animated television commercials utilizing print illustrators as designers, an approach they continue to this day creating over 500 broadcast projects. So he stays a little bit busy, I think. He began his career in animation on cartoon television specials, later collaborating with Robert Smigel on creating the ambiguously gay duo, the ex-presidents, and the fun with real audio cartoons for SNL. He personally designed the AGD characters Ace and Gary. I think that's hysterical. JJSP also launched the first season of MTV's acclaimed Beavis and Butthead series in 1993. So that's who these wonderful people are sitting up here. I was wondering who it is. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to just have some casual conversation. I've prepared some questions for each of them. Hopefully they will, <laughs> they will, they will answer them in I'll some just do a form. Spit take the same time. <laughs> just wing it. So oh, that's what I plan to do. Peter, oh. hi. I'm so glad you started with me. Now. <laughs> I am going to start with you. So Peter, here's my first question for you. Many artists have a vision of the art they want to create. That's when they, what the question was. Go do ahead. You remember Sorry, it now? Ahead. Do you yeah, remember yeah. it now? I got it. I got Good. it. Many artists, I'll repeat it, have a vision of the art they want to create when they are children and then through their art training. Your most celebrated work spans very different audiences and forms. What did you start out expecting to create as an artist? Well, first of all, I, I didn't know I was an artist for a long time. I just drew. I loved to draw as a, a little kid and I just kind of needed to draw in high school. In, well, elementary school, high school, I was always drawing on the, on the margins of papers and kind of obsessively. Um, but uh, I didn't find out you could actually be an illustrator until I had an art teacher in high school, who, a guy named Chuck Lees, who was an illustrator and uh, kind of made me realize this is actually a profession. And that and, was just a regular high school, right? It wasn't a special uh, yeah, high school. Yeah, it was, yeah. I, I went to school in um, Long Island. Um, but my plan... The art I wanted to create was I wanted to draw for Spider-Man. I thought that's that's what I would do. And then I went to Parsons and I never drew a Spider-Man. No. I know. It's sad. There's were still you, time. Were you Romita or Ditko? I was uh, Romita as long as he was inking Gil Kane. Okay. That's just me. <laughs> so then at Parsons, you obviously realized that you were going to spend your well, you know, I there was I, I realized I think before I got to Parsons that there was nothing else I could do. There was there was there were no options, so I had to make this art thing work. And and I, I went to Parsons while Murray Tinkleman was uh, mm -hmm. was the chairman there. Yeah, me and too. He was a you know big proponent and very protective of his illustrators and illustration in general. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I it was a very uh, it was a very comfortable place, and I and I uh, I learned a lot about illustration, a, a lot of different kinds of illustration while I was there. That opened things up for me, for me quite a bit. But then, with all the different things that you do, did was there one thing that you you really were focusing in on? Like, did you think to yourself, I really just want to be an editorial illustrator? I mean, when did the whole animation? I, uh, I think the, I think the editorial thing was that that's. That's where I was naturally inclined. It was sort of telling stories in one picture, and uh, and that's the kind of work I I did best, I guess, when I was at Parsons. And then started my career right afterwards with very small black and white illustrations for computer magazines and terrible little magazines. And the work just kind of 
progressed until I started to get more, you know, larger pieces in color, um, and better magazines, etc. And then, and then one day, uh, in, like, I guess around '93, I illustrated something uh, called Finn McCool, which is an Irish folk tale for an outfit called Rabbit Ears, and it was a kind of, it was kind of a video. A combination. It was almost animation, but it didn't really move, which is sort of sad for animation. <laughs> but um, it was a story about a, a. It was a folk tale about an Irish giant, and somebody at, at Disney saw it. A guy named Roy Conley, and uh, he was producing *The Hunchback of Notre Dame*. He called me up. He asked me if I wanted to work on that. And I was like, sure. And then ever since, I've been doing uh, character design for for one film or another. Thank but it's, it was not something I ever planned on. I guess right, that's, that, that's the yeah. most important part, is that none of it did I plan. I thought I was going to be a comic artist, and I turned out to be an editorial illustrator. Then uh, I never thought I would ever do a New Yorker cover. I thought only New Yorker artists do New Yorker covers. And, um, and you know, all these things sort of happened in a, in a very organic way. And children's books, too. And I mean. Children's books, yeah, a little bit, yeah. I'd sort of go with the flow. So I think, is that something that when you talk to students or students should really think about when they're starting their careers? Like, you know, yes, sometimes you really have a focus and you have to be flexible and you have to sort of... I, I, I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, it, editorial illustration, print illustration is, has really suffered in recent years. And some people think I was absolutely brilliant to diversify and go into animation. <laughs> it was not a plan at all, but if anything, maybe I was open to it. And, and I do encourage students to be open to, to opportunities they, they might not have, have planned on. You can't, you can't just aim for one niche. And, and you should train yourself in, in sort of broader skills that you can apply to different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And right now, currently, obviously, you might not be able to talk about some of the things you're working on. No, I, I can't. You can't. I know. See, <laughs> no, that's, I'm what, kidding. that's what happens um, all the time when I ask. Um, them. I get the same answer. No, no I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm working on. I am. I'm developing, and this is something I never, ever thought I would do. Is is um, pitch? A, I pitch a story to to Blue Sky. Um, it's an animation studio that did Ice Age, um, that that whole franchise. And I pitched them this idea, and they, and they bought it. And so I've become a kind of the de facto director on it until they find a real director. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've been developing it. I've been in development hell for, for many years now. But I never thought I would be in, I'm also technically a, the executive producer. Mm. And so I'm shepherding the story, and I'm doing, uh, working with writers, and I'm doing character designs, and uh, none of it. Could I have uh, planned on? So I'm doing two of those simultaneously, and uh, and I'm I'm working for a, a small animation studio in Paris that is doing The Little Prince mm -hmm. as an animated feature. And what's uh, the timing that, on that? Uh, I think it's still about two years out, really? but I'm excited about it because it's not a it's not a big, super big budget thing. It's not DreamWorks or Disney, and and they don't have to absolutely hit all these marks that these movies need to hit in order to be colossal blockbusters. This one just plans on being good. <laughs> so I'm kind of excited about that. Good. Okay. Thank you. Well, You're welcome, Anel. We'll, we'll if you have more. any other questions. We'll talk. I do. I do have other questions. Should we leave? <laughs> yes, because <laughs> we're having such a nice time. <laughs> Nora. Skip Nora. Nora. You've worked as an artist on two continents. Can you compare that experience? And also, can you talk to us a little about what you think? Is there an equivalent of Mocha Fest in your European experience? And talk a little to us about that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, now I mainly work in America. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I'm German, and I've worked uh, in different countries in Europe as well. Um, and I've certainly traveled there, so I think I can talk out of that perspective. Do you mean comics specifically or illustration? I think, I think both. I think you cross over to both, so I think that it's appropriate to talk about both. Um, I mean, I think my sense is that 
America definitely is the most commercial market, the biggest market for illustration and animation and mainstream comics. And um, I think after that it would be uh, England that has a very strong children's book you know, activity going on there. Um, but then there's Belgium and France, which are very strong for comics. Um, and so I think it really depends on the field. And, but I think the main uh, difference is probably that, um, you know, and this relates to what Peter was just saying about uh, Disney Studios compared to a small animation studio in France or also in, in America. Um, the size is just smaller because the audience is smaller. Mm -hmm. I mean, in children's books too, if you publish a book in Polish, you have a smaller readership, so you, you uh, publish fewer copies, then you sell fewer co copies, and therefore you don't make as much uh, money, so it's not as commercial a market. Um, but that also means that there's more freedom to really do what you, what you want to do. And in children's books, I'd say you see that in particular in Italy and France. Um, also in Japan, I would say, where they just um, talk. They're not as afraid uh, of talking about serious subjects. Mm. Um, they're not as afraid of telling stories. They don't have a classic beginning, middle, and end part. Mm. Uh, they sometimes end abruptly. Um, and so I think that's the main difference, although, of course, you can find that here as well in America if you work with certain kinds of publishers. Um, and then in terms of comic festivals that compare to MoCA, I think there are quite a few in Europe that are interesting. The ones, um, I mean, uh, there's Angoulême, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. That's probably the biggest and in Europe most commercial comics festival in France. Um, and, uh, and then there's also a small interesting one in uh, Lucerne in Switzerland mm. called um, Fumetto. Mm. And um, I've been there a few times. They also have American guests. They have a competition every year where you can submit a story and the winner is flown over and um, put up and gives a talk. And uh, it's just a very nice scale because the whole town is involved oh, and all the stores are involved and they offer artists to exhibit in, the, in their storefronts all across town. So oh, it's really a, a town event. When does that take place? I think in April as well. Oh. And um, yeah, again, so I think the scale is a little bit smaller and there isn't as big an interest in the extremely commercial comic stuff, I think. So do you think... Um, with our involvement now with, with MOCA, we have a real opportunity to do outreach to some of these international, whether it's comic organizations or individual comic. I mean, no, we, I know we do have some international representation here, mm -hmm. the Danish comic artists and Swedish, and we're, we're doing a lot now with the French embassy, um, with some of the French artists. You think we have, is that a place where you see we can have opportunity to? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. I don't know if that's been done already. I don't know how much these festivals have connected amongst hmm. each other, but it would be a good thing to do, I think. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be really interesting, absolutely. And maybe even have us have more representation mm -hmm. in some way over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Laura. Arnold. Yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dear, I love that. <laughs> Caroline, is that okay? Yes, dear. You probably hear that all the time. <laughs> she doesn't look very happy. <laughs> Arnold. Yes. Art affects society. We know that. Do Did you, you say infects? <laughs> it does. It does that too. It totally oh, okay. does that too. Yes. Do you feel that your political and social commentary, whether it was for the National Lampoon or the Progressive, helped make an impact? or even change the society we live in? And the answer, of course, you'll give us, we'll talk a little bit about that, but how can artists use their conscience to improve the world? Do you think they can? Do you think making a statement in, in this way can? Well, uh, I'll tell you something about society and the world. Okay. A, cartoonists would, if they could, would make a terrible mistake to improve it. What have we been drawing about all these years? Good point. Would you want to live in a perfect society? No. No, thank you. No, no. No one ever has. We know that. But uh, just as an idea, I think that's a... Uh... Anyway, I've seen society. I've drawn them. 
So, but do you think... They can't be improved. Society can't be improved. No, I, I... No, but do you think that when what you've drawn has, you know, made an impact on people? Do you think people have looked at your work and maybe thought... Well, it's not really done with that purpose. It's okay. done to express okay. what I want to draw and what I think about that particular subject. And, uh, but uh, I'm also a member of the editorial cartoonists, and I'm always, and it's not just the younger uh, members. Uh, I always was surprised when they thought it was within their power to change society through political cartooning. And um, I don't know that it's ever worked. I, uh, we know about Thomas Nast and the effect. That, uh, when you're doing drawings three, four, seven times a week, and you keep banging on the same drum, I think you do, you can have an effect. Mm -hmm. But I don't think an individual picture sometimes, which would be what I have always printed. And do you think when you, when you look at what's being done today in terms of the younger generation, do you think that they are aware of the issues of the world as maybe we yeah. were some of, I think, what you said no, right, JJ? Did you just say no? No, I didn't no. say no. That was just a... <laughs> was just a I mean, just kind of... I mean, I, like I you know, I, 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 I always question that, you know, and I, I find it a little concerning that I think that there's not as much awareness on the part of um, maybe up-and-coming illustrators, cartoonists, of what's happening in society, and I... I just don't know if any of you have a comment. Yeah, on I that. think such work is being done, and all. I don't know how much effect it has. But the, you've got it, now you've got things like The Daily Show and Colbert that kind of pick up where some of the cartooning used to go, and it's on a you know daily basis, and uh, and and also you've got uh, uh, newspapers and 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 areas on the web and so forth that seem to cater s to such specific groups and preaching to the choir well, that there isn't as much. Mm -hmm. Exa exactly. I, I mean, the, the few political drawings I've done have been just that, preaching to the choir. It's only, you know, it, it, it's only we're saying, we're all saying the same thing on my team. You know? mm. But I think there are also um, different ways of being political. I mean, if you think of Marjan Satrapi's book, that was mm -hmm. immensely successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily always, you know, it wasn't like a political cartoon that made a point, a straightforward, immediate point. It was a story to told out of, out of a personal <coughs> point of view, and it was political in that way, and it probably made some people think uh, differently about Iran um, or Iranians who mm -hmm. are also mm -hmm. suffering from the regime. And um, I just had a conversation with somebody at the society a few days ago when we had the um, little introductory party to MOCA um, about the fact that some schools have um, crossed it from their agenda and they're now trying to convince them to, um, to bring it back. And mm -hmm. I think it's a very important tool mm -hmm. in high schools because I think we have a very um, blurry image of some of these countries that are considered yeah. you know, dangerous and are, you know, but, but it's not necessarily the people. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that can be very powerful and very poetic at the same time and not necessarily direct and immediate. Uh, but absolutely, but that's that's more like a graphic novel, which has a longer yeah. story to tell, versus uh, the kind of thing that say Arnold yeah. and I would do, yeah. just single illustrations. But yeah, I think the form of the graphic novel is, is something more powerful and and revealing of of, uh, of subjects we might not know yeah. much about. So yeah, absolutely. So in that respect, I mean, I think that area of comics, if we want to call graphic novels comics, they're not always funny, as you say. I think that that area is really growing, and I think that the young people are maybe telling their story in, in, in longer ways and in ways that... Uh, uh, no question, and, and I think uh, places like MoCA represent, they, it sort of highlights the fact that there are all these young voices that can now publish their own work. Mm -hmm. They might not get the distribution they want, but there's no there's no sort of editorial constraints. Right. And I think it's a it, it's an extremely potentially rich time for for artists to be 
to be publishing and telling whatever stories they want. And artists get involved in different ways than they used to because there are so many different outlets. Because uh, look at what Steve Brodner does. You know, he's, he's, he gets involved in film. He gets involved in, you know, animation. He, um, uh, even the, no, there are just all sorts of ways of being able to get your story out there now that mm -hmm. there, there weren't. Graphic novels were comic books. They weren't popular. Now they're absolutely popular. Everything is a means And respected. Of, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. A yeah. good point. I know it was a well good point. Well taken. Thank you. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yes, Arnold. I think ha having an effect on society. I mean, uh, we've been celebrating Harvey Kurtzman. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, mad, and it, 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 Harvey didn't invent that uh, the attitude, uh, et cetera. But nobody much ran it. Al Cap was doing it in his strip. There were there was a lot of that attitude, and and it had popularity amongst the sort of people who think that way and agreed. And uh, but. Harvey made it so popular and with very young people, mm -hmm. and uh, um, I, I, I think Harvey and Hugh Hefner are two major figures that led up in the 50s to the 1960s, because the whole basic attitude, it wasn't one thing or that uh, mm -hmm. was affected, it was a whole way of looking at things. Uh, Pretty much what you were talking about, and uh, that does happen. But uh, uh, I, but it was done as honest work, not to change society. Uh, it was making fun of ridiculous, ridiculous existence with ridiculousness on the page. Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, for those of you who don't know, the uh, our Harvey Kurtzman show is up right now at the Society, and it's um, it's amazing. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I Oh, it's good. Yes, it's really great. But it's been fascinating, um, the, the range of age groups that have come to see this work. And we, we talked a lot about that when, when the show was being curated. You know, who's going to, who, who will be the demographic? Who will come? And it's been unbelievable to see the younger, younger people. I mean, a lot, a lot of younger people. But it's, it's just spanned decades. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. And it's... Very exciting. You know. Do you find that it's a mad-centric thing? Is that the strong pulling? No. Well, it's part of it, yes. I mean, well, I know it's got to be part of it. I'm it's sure it's part of it. And the younger people who are coming are, are totally aware of the mad-centric thing and knowing Harvey Kurtzman. But there's lots of people coming, of course, for little Annie Fanny and just, you know, just the, the influence that he had on so many underground comics artists now, over the years and now, oh, and obviously absolutely. in the future, of course. It's, it's extraordinary to see the I'm the glad diverse. Arnie mentioned Hefner, though, because a lot of people don't realize how much Hefner loved, loved, people, though it is loved. People don't, and maybe, <laughs> you know, you cartoons. Could, yeah, maybe you could just talk for two seconds about that, because it is very, very interesting, and I was not aware of it as much until you know Monty and I have been talking so yeah. much about it. So just t maybe talk for two seconds about what he... <laughs> <laughs> well, many years ago, uh, uh, the uh, NCS, National Cartoonist Society, uh, gave Hefner uh, an award. And uh, he, he got up to the microphone and he said, um, I don't know if many of you know this, but I really started out, I wanted to become a cartoonist. Of course... I'm not sorry the way things have turned out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's true. And uh, I, I worked with him, and Harvey did too. And Annie Fanny was a fantastic adventure. And he could be very picky about it, uh, Hefner. But he watched everything. He loved, really loved to see cartoon work. And... Uh, and he had a terrific uh, uh, cartoon editor, Mich the late, Mich unfortunately, Michelle Yuri. She was very intelligent. She knew everything, and she knew a lot about cartooning and cartoonists. So she could call our number <laughs> when we were trying to pull things. 
And, uh, uh, but they, the, the cartoons in Playboy had a huge effect on the, of course, they, they opened up, opened things up for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's like the New Yorker now prints dirty were Anglo-Saxon curse words, and, mm -hmm. at least. And uh, they weren't going to do it in the 1950s or 60s. So uh, uh, that's the sort of effect they had. I don't know that it's a good one. <laughs> but <laughs> Towards the end, I mean, he's not really associated that much with Playboy anymore. But up to that point, he was the one championing the cartoonists. He was mm -hmm. the one that wanted to see cartoons, illustration, Yes. You know, art-directed things in in the magazine, yes. and they were constantly trying to get him to not do it. Yeah. And so, uh, and 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 with somebody like Jack Cole, who was a comic book artist, yeah. and then did illustrations. That story is very interesting too. And that's how I got to know about Hefner's, you know, love of uh, of comics and cartoons. Yeah. I had no idea either until a few years ago. It's pretty interesting. Wait, Jack Cole was with Plastic Man. Plastic Man. Okay. Okay. Mm. I, I remember, this is a long time ago, uh, visiting, uh, Hefner had this mansion which he was always publicizing in the magazine. And, and I, I, I went there a few times. And uh, then he moved to LA and I went there uh, sometimes. And it was on one of those visits, he pulled me aside and said, I now have a complete collection of the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was like, you know, this guy had everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so great. happy. <laughs> wow. wow, that's that great. great. That's a great story. Thank you. So, JJ. <sighs> yeah, I know. We know that art touches all lives, whether people actually realize whether it's subconscious or unconscious or whatever. Some of your work has touched literally <laughs> the unconscious, the unconscious yeah. <laughs> the unconsciously touched their lives. It has, killed seven. <laughs> <laughs> some of your work literally has touched tens of millions of lives without identifiable credit to you. When you look back on your journey as an artist, do you feel satisfied with projects like your work helping to create the Cartoon Network, or is it the more con concrete, frameable artwork that feels more rewarding to you? Can you just talk a little bit about all of those aspects of what you've done and how you feel about that? Well, um, first of all, what's interesting about the question is that um, I've been fortunate in that I have gotten credit. Good. So that title card that started on Saturday Night Live and was originally um, a payback for a storyboard that they didn't want to pay for um, kind of put us on the map. Hmm. Um, the problem was, because we did Saturday, the Saturday Night Live cartoons for the first three years, and they went on for about 11. And... As terrific as it was to get all the recognition for the cartoons, which were fantastic, and it was great to be a part of them, um, the we got we got branded. I really learned what branding was about because I designed that title card in about a half an hour when I found out that again we we had done a storyboard, it got killed. I asked to be paid. They said we're not going to pay you. I said okay, well then I want my own title card, and they they were like you know. <laughs> whatever and I was like so got this title card up there and every Saturday when we had a cartoon you know this thing was indelibly kind of etched into people's heads and then we st so much of our work was commercial work in, in advertising where we didn't have a title card and um, um, as, as, as rich as the Saturday Night Live cartoons were and funny and entertaining they were of a specific kind of style, which was kind of crummy animation, and uh, but very funny. After doing this stuff for about two years, I started getting calls from advertising agencies, uh, and, and I could tell when they'd get me on the telephone, they felt very proud of themselves because at the bottom of the title card it says, White Plains, New York. <laughs> and they obviously had gone 
into a phone book and found our number and they said, I'm so glad I was able to reach you. Would you ever, uh, we really like your work on Saturday Night Live, would you ever consider doing a television commercial? And that's when I thought, oh my God, you know, they're gonna, they think this is all I do. When we've, I've worked with Peter, I've worked with all these wonderful artists to translate their work into animation and here they think this is the only thing we do. So we backed away from SNL, we kind of bailed. And the <laughs> problem is, everybody thought we were still doing it because that color beige continued through and that's all they saw. So, you know, a nice strong color like beige <laughs> <laughs> represents. <laughs> so um, I do get credit. Good. And uh, it has been marvelous getting credit because I can use that very easily. I have actually been able to get that title card onto commercials too. So um, the, uh, the, the recognition um, uh, came, uh, it was fun, but then it was a double-edged sword and I had to be uh, very careful how to kind of manage it from then on. And what was the second part of the question? <laughs> No, I think JJ. that was... JJ, that was at it? Yeah, okay. I think that was the whole question. Yeah. So thank you. So, uh, yeah. that's uh, about it. Okay. I'm going to do another round of questions now, and then we want to leave time for the audience to ask you guys questions, too. So, Peter. Hi. Peter, you're going to like this one. I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. Peter, art is often a lonely mission. How do you find the society helps you? It, it is a lonely mission. I know. And, and it was lonelier when I started out because I, I graduated Parsons in 1980, I think, and um, there were no, none of these computer machines, as you call them. Um, so, so my social life, basically, among the few illustrators I knew was late night, midnight, through Pink Dawn, as we used to call it, while we were working all night, working on our, uh, our our pieces, and we'd call each other and have idiotic conversations. Carter Goodrich, H.B. Lewis, uh, occasionally Brian Ajar. There was this network that uh, we kept each other going, but but still, that was mostly over the phone. And and being an illustrator is a very solitary business. You know, it's just you and your garret if you are lucky enough to have a garret. Um, so the Society of Illustrators thing was was a wonderful development for me because we would have the, there would be the annual exhibition which was the big show and uh, it was two parts at the time I think I don't think there Wait, was even a sequential then, yeah. maybe. no there wasn't sequential back but then. it was a real opportunity to meet artists whose work you really loved and ad admired and. Uh, and that doesn't always work. It's not always always a great thing. Uh, some some you know sometimes it's a good idea not to meet your hero, but uh, other times it it can be a really wonderful thing. And I've made many many great friends, some of whom I only see once a year uh, at the society. And so it's a, a weird. It's like a Star Trek episode. It's like I see them every. I see them age. <laughs> <laughs> Each to, amazingly, I don't age at no, all. Which not is at kind all. Of a, no, not a, a miracle. No, no, you, you're going. The yeah, I'm going back. It's a yeah. yeah, Benjamin Button thing. But um, <laughs> no, but it really, it, it really has been a, a great thing, a great network, and there are people I'm, I'm always so happy to, to see again, and 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 by knowing them, it, it started many conversations, which are still going on decades later. So uh, it's not as lonely as it used to be. That's good. And I think that, and tell me what all of you think, because you know about you know all of the programming that we've been doing. I mean, I think that it really gives the younger people now an opportunity to, to be there and to, to meet people. And more, more than ever. And I do uh, take this opportunity to uh, congratulate Anel in, in doing that and to, to refreshing the society. It's been, you know, a. Uh... It's not. It's not just giving them an opportunity to come. It's giving them a reason to come. Absolutely. There was. I remember. <laughs> um, I remember what it was like when I'd be standing there, like with David Golden, and and we'd both be going, 
what are we doing here? You know, this, there's no, there's like no feel. They don't really get what. That's not the case anymore. You know, it's a great place to go, and you really want to be a part of everything that's going on there. So, it's a great thing, and it's yeah. it's it's you and it's you as well, sir. No. Yeah. Yeah. I think but it, anyway. Yeah, it's not just one person. I mean, it was a huge goal of mine when I when I got there six years ago to to make it more relevant and to make it more inviting for young people. But I certainly could never do it alone. I There's a sense a, of humor there now. Too. Yeah, over yeah, It was the most humorless. <laughs> it, it, it had been, you know, it sort of was in uh, a, a sort of suspended animation, if you'll excuse me. Now, the who's laughing yeah. in the audience? <laughs> who, who wearing these white shirts is, is laughing? But there's we been are very a, funny there. There's yes. been a greater effort to, uh, to, to embrace other styles, I think, and other mm -hmm. kinds of work that you wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't have expected to ever make it on on the walls, and it's that's the healthiest possible thing for the place. And the place does seem healthier. It's brighter. You've refurbished it, and and it's a it's a pleasure to go there. It's 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 great. Yeah, and it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I really like being in that building. Yeah. <laughs> well, we like oh, she made it terrific. It's a good bar too. It's a great bar. <laughs> the major bar the, drinks. the major repeal when you're young and you're you're starting out is you, all your heroes would no, congregate no. there. It's the same way with the cartoonist societies. And um, but after a while, you move into that age, uh, and you know life's like that. And uh, then the place becomes very important. But it's great, and it's, it's not just because you uh, talk business scuttlebutt or anything, no, no. but. You, you get that sense of each other that somewhere there's this, a great reason for being sympathetic with each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you've done it throughout the library, the reference library, which was yeah. kind of slammed to a halt with anything. It went up to like 1962, I think. Yeah. And now Probably. it's in order, it's organized, it's available, it's... Yeah. Uh, Kate Firetag. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Kate, yay, Kate. Well, we have, you know, we we have a great team at the society now, and I think, you know, as I always say, it's not just one person; it's a team of people that really have to work together and make things happen. So it is an exciting time, and I think now with a, a focus on comic and cartoon art, it's even more exciting mm -hmm. um, for me. It is anyway, and I know it is for the entire society because I think we have. So many more opportunities with, you know, having, you know, renovated that second floor gallery now to just focus on cartoon and comic art. We have, there's so much more we can we can be doing, and it's just gonna. It's a natural combination. Yeah, it's incredible. Both, both teams win. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Nora, I really want to just touch on this because I think um, this is important. As a as a professor. How do you go about trying to bring out the unique voice of a student with their art and help them define and create their mission of individuality? And I think that's, I think it's really important to talk of just for a few minutes about mm. that because. Yeah, I think that's basically what defines a teacher is to, yeah. um, and also what is different from working in the field as opposed to teaching about the field because you have to really move beyond yourself and your own personal taste or your own personal understanding of the field and really listen to the students and be open-minded and try to understand them as people uh, in the first place because our work is so much about who we are as well in some way, even if you know we don't talk about ourselves constantly in our it's work. It's definitely a reflection. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, um, so I think it's just very important to um, to get a sense of who they are. And also, I mean, at Parsons, we really, I mean, Peter was talking about this earlier, about the decline of the print um, world, or at least the editorial world. Um, and that used to be the biggest market. And so our focus has been uh, moving a little bit away from that, still teaching it, um, but also really um, expanding the notion of what illustration can be. And of course, um, comics, graphic novels is a big part of it. Um, animation, um, toy design, mm. uh, set design that's illustrative, performance and illustration. So there's a very wide range of what illustration means today or can mean. And, and of course, uh, students are the new generation that will define what that is. So you also have to listen to them because mm -hmm. in some ways they're much more in tune with what's going on. 
And the other thing is authorship that we've been stressing a lot at Parsons, that illustrators today should not only um, consider themselves as uh, people who create the content for somebody else's, uh, the, the illustration for somebody else's content. Mm. Um, that used to be the classic model. Um, I mean, unless you did cartooning, but in the editorial magazine uh, newspaper world, you were given an article and then you had to illustrate it. Um, and I think what we really try to do is focus on, <laughs> I'm just looking at the former director of the program <laughs> for checking his approval, but, um, <clears throat> but uh, we're really focusing on authorship because I think if you, I think critical thinking about the field, uh, also applying your ideas to society as a whole is very important and not to see it just as an art form or something you enjoy doing, but you know, what does it mean in the context of the world we live in? And then also uh, inventing your own content uh, is very important because I think the more innovative you are as an artist, the better chances, I mean, you see it with these three guys, the better chances you get uh, to do really interesting work. And maybe also work that pays well, I don't know, but, um, <laughs> but you know, because uh, innovation... As they roll their eyes. <laughs> because that's what's really the most valuable thing, is the thinking and um, the innovative approach, and not just can you draw. Yeah, you know? I, think, I think there's a lot of that upstairs on the yeah. armory floor at the moment. I mean, there's some pretty amazing things going on up yeah. there, mm -hmm. and I think it's exciting to see that. that well, it's all self-generated. Uh, yeah, and, that, and that's that's the yeah. the key to it. And yeah. we see that too in the illustration in the uh, Society of Illustrators uh, uncommissioned show when we yep. do the annual judging mm -hmm. for that. Yep. Um, that's often the most interesting and compelling work, I think, mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. it's also self-generated and it's um it's very personal and it's very yeah. just interesting. Yeah, it is. And when and when that show is judged, as you both know, because you've been chairs of that and you've been judges as well um, and the way we judge it now on on the computers I mean when the when art directors are looking at that work I mean they're writing down names yeah. of, <laughs> of people yeah. and and very often they're they're young people that some of them are even students especially in the uncommissioned category yeah. and they're actually getting getting some work which yeah. is pretty yeah. exciting yeah. so yeah so Arnold I want to just talk briefly about um, you had a, a exhibit at the Society in the new MoCA Gallery. Um, Thank just, you. Yes, you're very welcome. And we were thrilled to have that artwork there. And it's beautiful. I think one of the most amazing things for me at that at that exhibit, when I would walk down onto the second floor, you would hear people laughing. I mean, there was just like <laughs> laughter coming from the second floor because people would just like walk and and read and really just take in your work and they would just by themselves. They weren't, you know, and, and it was just, it was really a great thing. So I thank you for that because well, I think it was you. really wonderful. And um, That's I know. That's the purpose of the work. I know that. Realize. I know <laughs> that and it's, it, it, it happens and you're successful with it and we were thrilled to have that and um, we're so thrilled to have that gallery there now. And I know you and Caroline both, and Caroline is here, are, doing incredible outreach right now with the National Cartoonist Society and bringing them back to oh. our society. And I, I thank you for that. And yeah. we've had, so if you could just talk I for two seconds. I wish you luck. It would be great. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've had meetings there now, and the, the cartoonists are yeah, coming sure. back and seeing that, again, it's just a really welcoming place. So I think that we have so much opportunity with that now, and there's so much great stuff. So thank you. My Thank pleasure. You. So I feel like you're spearheading that, helping to spearhead that for us, and it's a great thing. So. Well, thanks for the opportunity, mostly for my wife to do a lot of hard work. <laughs> she did a lot of hard work, <laughs> yes, and she, she deserves do, to be She thanked. does what, when Anel <laughs> said to me, we were at the society, she said, uh, would, would you agree to have an exhibition here? And Caroline was standing a couple feet away. I pointed at her and I said, Yes, if she agrees to do all the work, and she did. And she did. Yes, she did. So thank you, Caroline. You <laughs> so one last question um, for JJ. You, um, you blog about very eclectic topics. We've sort of touched on this now. All of these topics are relevant 
to aspects of the mission of the society. Um, what do you see as some possible ways we can move ahead and connect all of that diversity and now use our MOCA, MOCA connection to more effectively add comics to our mix? What, what more do you think that we can Well, we first can do? of all, you know, congratulate. It was, it was, um, it was funny going downstairs um, Thursday when I was there and seeing that little dedication you did to Windsor McKay because of the little theater you have there. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's in a copy of his acceptance letter. To the society. In, to the society. Yeah. And, um, you know, to me, Windsor McKay represents everything from cartooning to illustration to animation to... Pure yeah. genius. <laughs> and, and, and why there's been a barrier uh, in terms of thinking about incorporating every aspect of kind of created design just doesn't make sense to me. So you're starting to do it. I mean, it should include everything. And it should include uh, uh, everything from not only strips and... Um, uh, um, illustration, but, you know, if there's a package designer that, you know, uses some form of illustration, I mean, bring it all in and use this as an opportunity to really show everybody what, you know, not only you're about, but what the, um, the art's about. Um, it's, uh, I just really could never grasp why there was this uh, um, yeah. aversion towards certain type of uh, drawing. I think they've always been regarded as like two different species of work, and not they necessarily were right. Professions at one point. Yeah. And they really were different economic streams. Mm -hmm. I think with the erosion of print, they they can't be separate anymore because illustrators make comics because they there isn't enough. I think that's true. I, that's caused everybody to diversify in a way. And yeah. it's the respect that comic. Maybe for not all the right reasons, but the respect that comic books and comics and graphic novels and all that has attained. Mm -hmm. um, you know, personally, I'll take upstairs over any of the comic cons, um, and, and and so you know. But you know, there's the splashiness that's made it popular and mm -hmm. will bring people in to see the stuff. Again, not for maybe all the right reasons, but you can get a great turnout. Um, with things that people uh, either would never have come to before, or certainly things that the society would never consider putting, you know, putting on their walls. So you know, you're doing it. It's well, and we will continue to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty exciting. I know we're running a little bit late. We're just like talking and talking, and I really want to show you. It's about a five-minute um, clip of a video, um, which I think. Is, is really going to be fun for you for you to watch. Um, it's not a piece that was made for this panel today. It's a, it's a video that we actually worked on at the Society together to use as a uh, fundraising tool. So if it seems a little bit stuffy in ways that doesn't relate to Mocha Fest, you're right, it is a little bit <laughs> stuffy because it's really a tool that we are now sending out to potential funders and donors, which of course you know is critical to us. So I want you to, I want you to just uh, watch it and then we'll just spend a few minutes um, having questions, questions and answers. So are we good still sitting here? Yeah. What's happening here? Well, it could have been a little bit yeah. more involved. Yeah. I said it. I said it. Was <laughs> you really support this industry. This is the only organization that supports the industry in the way it does. It's a crucial place for now. The society is not exclusive. Welcomes professional artists, fans of American culture, past and present, art lovers, and students. The Museum of American Illustration presents exhibits of extraordinary range and content, from the provocative, irreverent work of R. Crumb, or the scientific fantasy world images of Boris Vallejo, to Rolling Stone magazine's iconic images, from portraits of notables to the classic, stylish, trend-setting illustrations of J.C. Lyndon, from the nurturing delights of beloved children's books to the cutting-edge digital images seen in today's animated films. 
Its compelling show, featuring the art and energy of America's comics, showcased works from the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art, whose assets have been transferred to the society, creating a single institution supporting and celebrating illustration, comics, and animation. We have openings, and I stand in the middle of the room, and I'm the oldest one in the room. I'm really happy about that. It's great to be in a place where there's so much creativity. The Society's legendary sketch nights are led by some of the country's top illustrators. An open invitation is extended to everyone with an interest in art and culture. The most important thing for the Society today is our focus on education. We're educating on all levels now. It used to be just college. Now we reach out to high school students and to younger students as well. The Summer Drawing Academy one of the Society's many outreach programs is a highly regarded collaboration between the Society and the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. We get children in here, the Society gets illustrators to teach them how to draw with a life model, and in the afternoons we take them to museums. So it's a really beautiful program where children learn how to make art. And they come to a program for a month, and they really treat the children like kings here. It's a great program. The parents are also proud, the kids are very proud of themselves when we put their drawings up, so they're on display. We had a letter from one child's mother who said that the Drawing Academy changed her life, mm -hmm. which was so gratifying, it was wonderful. The Society of Illustrators has had a student scholarship exhibition and scholarship prizes for many, many years. These include scholarships awarded to college students nationwide and the Arthur Zahn Kell Scholarship, a tuition grant for a student's senior year. We wanted to encourage students who really wanted to pursue a career in illustration. And the winners have gone on to be successful. The Society's activities have expanded to include innovative exhibitions that benefit important social causes. When we did our line of fashion exhibit, which focused on fashion illustration through the decades, we collaborated with the Gay Men's Health Crisis Organization and we gave a percentage of proceeds back to them to help them with their art therapy programs. The Society also initiates joint projects in collaboration with other nonprofit organizations. We were so pleased to work with the Society, partnering with Amal Miller and all the staff and artists here. Illustration is not a static form. While artists still draw with a pencil and paint with a brush, Digital technology has also become an indispensable part of their trade. What this show attempts to demonstrate is that there is an illustration process behind animated films. Computer has changed the way things are done in an animated studio in the most drastic way. You hardly ever see actual paint. You're seeing printouts. That model that you see on the wall there, done in computer program, and I printed it out to create a physical maquette that did not exist. Today's young artists are as comfortable with the palette of computer programs as they are with traditional tools and techniques. First it starts as a drawing, then it becomes a sculpture, then they put a virtual skeleton in it so they can determine how it's going to bend and move. That's the magic of animation and the heritage of illustration art that's today one of the most popular and successful fields for illustrators. I'd like to see the public at large have an understanding of what illustration is and how important it is to the fabric of our society. The soul of the content of the piece, that's what really matters. Whether you're looking at a piece here that was done in 1978 or 2008, it's still on the artist's mind and their soul, and that's the one thing that doesn't change in any form of you know, creative endeavor. The tools just change, and that's okay, as long as the heart and soul's in it, that's what keeps it interesting. Since 1901, the Society has been at the center of American illustration, a storied meeting place and an inexhaustible resource for its members. And today, it has become more than that. It's also an institution of learning for aspiring artists, scholars, and students who have access to the extensive archives of its research center and who can share in all its programs on site or online around the world. The energy here is incredibly high. People are excited to be here. The Society continues to honor its history even as it looks forward, expanding its permanent collection, extending its educational outreach, and welcoming new generations of creative artists. For more than a century, 
The Society of Illustrators has supported its members while delighting its visitors, just as today the Society continues to preserve, present, and celebrate the ever-evolving art of illustration. Good stuff in there. It's fun, huh? So I know um, you might have a couple of questions for some of these wonderful people. We're running a little bit over, but if anybody does have some questions, we have microphones to uh, ask. Does anyone want to ask anything? All right. To anyone? No? Could the panelists speak to any experiences in regards to censorship in your illustration, in your professional work, whether it be financial, uh, fiduciary, you know, <coughs> any level of censorship? Censorship. Um, I had a um, cartoon that we did for Saturday Night Live, which for the most part you'd think would be a nightmare of censorship because of the sort of content, but actually it's not. Uh, Saturday Night Live has an umbrella kind of, of indemnification because of the stuff that they uh, do. But they self-censored uh, themselves. We did a, um, we did a piece called uh, Conspiracy Theory Rock, which was uh, takeoff on um, Schoolhouse Rock. And I, used, I worked with all the actual Schoolhouse Rock people because we had actually done some Schoolhouse Rock episodes. And this concerned... Um, uh, political graft and uh, uh, all the networks being in cahoots with uh, uh, corporations and how the controlling of information was, uh, was choreographed by the, the networks. And it aired in New York um, as scheduled, but <laughs> mysteriously somehow didn't make the feed to LA. Uh, and it turned out that the uh, well, I think it was Bob Wright, who's president. He had a shit hemorrhage. And then he got, I think it was Olmeyer, to yank it off. And uh, it, it was out of circulation for about 12 years. And then they, surprisingly, they put it on the SNL DVD. Um, other than that, but a lot of people, a lot of um, newspapers and, and so forth picked up on the fact that NBC itself centered itself. And in the cartoon, there's a bit where NBC yanks it off the air. <laughs> <laughs> so that about covers it. I don't know if I've had any episodes. No? My, my satire is rather gentle, I suppose. I don't think I've rankled too many people from what I can remember. I'm sorry to say, I should mm. be pissing people off. <laughs> what, what about the cover for the New Yorker with the, the new beach and the tattooed guy? Um, well, there was, there was uh, obviously, I didn't uh, censor myself at all with that because it was, uh, it's a, uh, it's a beach scene and there's a big naked guy you saw it there and he's tattooed everywhere but except on his butt. Um, and there were many people that um, that wrote in, and they were uh, outraged, and they canceled their subscription. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, good riddance to them. But weirdly, that was the uh, I think only the second uh, derriere that has appeared on the cover of the New Yorker. The the first one was mine as well. Um, no, I've done three, actually. One was a um, a. Uh, a guy going through security at the airport and just taking off everything, walking through the scanner. But uh, I think there were some canceled subscriptions there, too. I am happy to say that, actually. Yeah, I did piss off at least three people. <laughs> good. Yeah. That's good. Cheeky. Okay. Yes, back there. Hi. Um, so... After that video, um, there's something I've been thinking about as well. If you can speak to about um, the mentors in your life and how you went about seeking those mentorships and the valuable part of that relationship. Mm. 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 
with Cliff? I had two mentors. Um, I had a guy named Tony Eastman, who I discovered uh, while just showing my portfolio around to anyone who would look at it. Um, uh, I got his name from somebody at PBS, a guy named John Antes, who was an uh, art director there. And uh, he wrote down the name of Tony Eastman and um, R.O. Blackman and R. Greenberg, Bob Greenberg, who, uh, and, and Tony, I went to meet, we hit it off right away, and he started giving me stuff that he had animated so that I could work as an assistant animator, and, and he really launched me into the uh, business, and I later worked um, for and with R.O. Blackman. Um, there was another guy who I met at a, a studio called Perpetual uh, Motion Animation, a guy named Jan Svochak, who um, uh, was the guy who animated Punchy from Hawaiian Punch. Um, he, uh, I noticed that as an animator, he took longer than any, everyone else. Uh, he was very thorough and anal about how he did his exposure sheets, which are like the Bible of when you do animation. Uh, has all the instructions for the cameraman and all the drawings are exposed. <clears throat> but his stuff never came back for revisions. The other animators would crank the stuff out, but the stuff was constantly getting revised and fixed. And so, but, so I got to actually be his assistant exclusively for about a year and a half, which was unheard of. And I was a real pain in the ass about saying I really wanted to work with Jan, I really wanted to work with Jan. It, 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 and it, but it really paid off because the consistency I got out of the process was uh, fantastic. Uh, but I had to kind of go against what the norm was. You were supposed to just pick up a scene and work on it. Did you have any? Nora, did you have any particular? Uh, I was just trying to think. I, I don't think I've, other than which is embarrassing to say, but again, my husband, who was also <laughs> the <laughs> former program director uh, at Parsons, but uh, I mean, I think very sweet. hello. <laughs> it's a bit pathetic, but no, but he was. <laughs> <laughs> he was. I mean, he's always been. I met. Oh God. I met him Luckily, the there aren't time. many people here. <laughs> yeah, right. We're not here. Just talk. Did you? You must have had. A, <laughs> right. He's trying to change Sorry. the subject. Sorry. He doesn't want her to talk I, anymore. I really need to Don't you it. hate compact oh. fluorescence? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I met him when he was um, an art, uh, the art director of the Abed page at the New York Times. And, <laughs> so blah. and um, I, I was a student. And I mean, he was the first art director I went to see in New York. And um, I, uh, so I showed him my work, and he also gave him, me my first ever job. And, um, and then, I mean, we've shared, <laughs> I'm sorry, but we shared a lot of ideas about the field, and I think um, I learned a lot from that, you know, relationship. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, uh, other than that... This is good advice for you back there. <laughs> And you're not allowed to talk to anyone else. Right. <laughs> um, but other than that, I, I don't think, because I, I think I was always a little bit too uncomfortable being pushy. I think there's nothing wrong, wrong with, you know, what, no, but what, what, you, what you described uh, about being, you know. Outgoing, kind of, yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. But I, I think I was always a little bit um, too uncomfortable with that. And I think for everybody it's different. And everybody has to find mm. out what their best way of doing this is. I mean, what I did when I just gra graduated as a student and started out uh, was that I sent my work to um, either other illustrators or um, companies that I really admired, uh, telling them that I really admired their work and I wanted to introduce my work as an illustrator, which I think is, is a normal thing to do when you start out. Um, mm -hmm. And I got a lot of positive responses, and that's another great thing about America that I think is very different in in Europe where there's a bigger division between mm -hmm. the master and the scholar and here you can really contact people and they're friendly and they write back because they somebody yeah. helped them as well but I think I, I, I didn't have really a um, you know the same kind of mentor that, that you I mean I had great teachers mm -hmm. and, and I learned very valuable things from them but they weren't as consistent you know I mean consistent enough for me to call them mentors maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I would actually love to hear Arnie, what you guys 
got started. Um, what? Who were you looking at? I mean, who was? Who was the? Who did you aspire to be? I I can't remember when I didn't want to be a cartoonist. Um, so everybody affected me, and of course I became a you know a, a, a star in short pants because I could draw Popeye, and you know when I was like four or five years old. And uh, the the two most influential people at that time, uh, this is right after the Second World War, was when I was in art school. Not often enough, they kicked me out. And um, but uh, were, to me, at the top level, were Saul Steinberg and Ronald Searle, who was just coming into his own at the very late uh, 40s. Mm. And uh, but Saul Steinberg, uh, uh, he was like fell down from the moon, I think, for most of us. Yeah. But William Steig, I mean, it goes on. All the New Yorker people were very good. I'm very dismayed. I, uh, I work for a New Yorker, uh, and, uh, but they run stuff that, that it's just terrible artwork. I mean, it is, it is below amateur, good amateurs. I can't believe on. some of it. <laughs> It's uh, uh, you feel, is, that, is it still rolling? It, it is. It's still rolling. And, and the New Yorker is a very... Uh, I didn't work for them until... Uh, I, I went there in the early 50s, 51, when I started to freelance. They took a great interest in me. My portfolio, by the way, was what I've done my whole life. A complete picture that had humor in it. You know, a drawing. Uh, no text. And uh, no speech balloons. And, uh, uh, but when I got the con of their uh, system, I never wanted to work for people who would tell me what to do and how to do it. It might sound <laughs> terrible to you, but I've been, I've been very protective about that throughout my career. I've missed out on a lot of, uh, you know, making money. I, I've never been in advertising, which it was the big money, not not on uh, 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 publications. And uh, I'm not saying this to show you I'm a hero. It's complete selfishness. And uh, but I n knew that I was becoming more and more competent all the time graphically, and uh, and also staging. You know, uh, composition's always been a passion of mine, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I, I didn't, and a lot of editors had valid things to say. That were, and I said, well, I won't do that in the next one. <laughs> going, I hate to do anything over. I don't want to do anything twice. And uh, it, it, got, it went on like that and that. And I've had a wonderful career, as I said before, I think if I had become a painter, I'd be an expressionist, because I think my drawings are expressive, and they do uh, tell the literal uh, uh, part of what you're looking at. I mean, I think I try to make it clear, legible, no lettering. I mean, I'm a terrible letterer, uh, and uh, and that's the way I've worked, but. You don't articulate that in your mind, but it's in your spirit and your heart. And you know, to me, where you want to go. And what you said about you, you, there are places. It's like finding heaven while you're still alive. And you get very sympathetic, very good art directors, editors. That's what they want to uh, buy. I mean, but. At a certain level, I mean, I could see. They call up Duke Ellington, the bus pulls up, the band comes out, they set up, and, they, and then the, the person who called them up says, now I want you to play like this. Yeah. <laughs> and you, I want you. Well, Duke Ellington didn't take gigs like that. <laughs> and neither did I. Well, I think that, that's a, a really a crucial lesson to, to anybody starting out. That's how you remained 
who you are, yes. you, you kept your own singular yes. voice. Yeah. It cuts out a lot of territory, yeah. but it's territory you don't want to explore, well, is the way I've, I've always I, felt about I've, it. I've, uh, you know, at a certain point, I was able to, to, uh, to be able to say to the art director, you know what, I, I hear your idea, but it's not an idea I would use. It's not a joke I would tell, yeah. or the way I would tell a joke, yeah, and right. it's not me. And so, you know, I understand if you want to go somewhere else, but. What's the point in yeah. having me do your idea? Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important to be selective also when you start out to, uh, to uh, what you said about finding the right art director can be really a wonderful experience because I think you have to really think about what your work is about and uh, um, to try to find publications or publishers or editors uh, who you think understand what you do. And then it can be wonderful because yeah. then they hire you exactly for what you want to do. Yeah. And everybody else, everybody has also a different threshold for flexibility. I mean, I've, the children's book I've illustrated, I certainly made some compromises that I was happy with. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's good. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I also didn't feel like somebody tried to twist my arm. So I think it's always a matter of, of right. how far you want to go. Yeah, you do have to be, you can't reject everything. You have to listen. Sometimes it's the idea is a good one. Too. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're seeing it in a way you're not seeing it. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've had uh, a couple of things corrected, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know what? That actually does make better sense, too. All right. As a matter of fact, there was a woman, this would be in the very early 80s at Esquire. She had a, one of the best names ever in art, April Silver. <laughs> it, it sounds like a soap that you don't buy. <laughs> but it's a, you but a, wow, I bet a lot of people buy that soap. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and uh, uh, when she, uh, she was an, the assistant to the art director, and uh, I was launching on, but went on to a huge thing through the whole 80s. But uh, I said to her, uh, look, I don't know you. and." I don't know if you know my work, but I told her my ground rules. And she said, oh, that's great. I said, I do I, my idea, and I do it the way it, I th think it would be best realized. And uh, she said, oh, thank God. She said, all the artists we've been interviewing say, well, what should I draw? Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> so, a bad thing so to I ask. Said, yeah, well, good luck to them. They'll, they can take all those other jobs. You know. Well, clearly, I think you can see that we can sit here for hours having this conversation. I know we've run over, and I appreciate everybody staying. Um, it's been